hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show where we talk about anything we feel like where the Fab Four are concerned. Their years together, their years, their solo careers, what's going on in the news, whatever we feel like talking about is covered here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels, and hopefully you know my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing which currently airs on about 50 radio stations. I also co-host another Beatles talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which is just as the title says, it's all about the solo careers of the Beatles. And I have my own YouTube channel as well called Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with interviews and all kinds of features on the Fab Four. And I'm being joined by my two regulars here on the show. First of all, a man who's been a fixture in New York radio for the past 40 years at New York's WFUV. And he does all kinds. He's always promoting that radio station. Doesn't give me a T-shirt like that. But well, okay, I got this one. <laughs> I've got to get the WFDU T-shirt on. We'll, we'll battle each other on camera. WFUV, WFDU. Okay, where every little thing is heard. But he's been doing all kinds of great programs on the radio station for four decades, including Beatles specials as well. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, Ken. Hello, Alan. And Alan Cousin, of course, is with us. He, along with Adrian Sinclair, uh, wrote, well, volume one so far of the McCartney Legacy, soon to be McCartney Legacy volume two. Ooh, look at how he teases us. Oh, wow. Nice. Doesn't send any advanced PDFs <laughs> yet. But, um, no well, advanced PDFs, I, no FUV t-shirts for Ken. It's not edited yet, so we're working on that. I don't care. I'd rather have the unedited version, figure out what stuff you take out later. Mm. So along with the McCartney legacy, he's also known for the books, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop as well as Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and of course, spent many years at the New York Times in their classical department writing reviews on classical music, and was their Beatles authority there. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone out there. This time out, um, I figure we'll do something that I've been doing on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, as a, as a feature every now and then. It's called The Fab Five. And what I ask my guests to do on my channel is to pick five albums, one Beatles, one from each solo Beatle, that happen to be your go-to albums at the moment. And it's just an interesting study to find out what people are in the mood to listen to right now, for whatever the reason, find out what the reasons are for those particular albums. And those, of course, can change from week to week or year to year. But uh, I thought we'd have some fun with that idea in just a few minutes but as usual we have the latest beetle news to get to here and we're going to start with news all about ringo uh his fifth ep crooked boy had its official release on cd and vinyl back on may 31st ringo right now is in the middle of his latest tour with his all-star band having played the first two of 12 shows on the tour both at the venetian in las vegas and while in Las Vegas, he and the All-Stars went to see the Beatles' love at the Mirage Hotel and posed with the cast for a photo. Love, in fact, will be running its final shows, two of them uh, on uh, July the 6th. And Ringo hits Mexico City this Wednesday and Thursday. Unfortunately, Edgar Winter has not been able to perform with the All-Stars. Can't say for sure what's wrong. If he is in ill health, don't want to give out misinformation here, but so far he's missed the shows in Las Vegas. And Ringo has teamed up with Fandium.com for a contest in which you and a guest can meet Ringo in Los Angeles on his birthday, July 7th, for his annual Peace and Love event. Ringo is asking that you make a donation to his charity, the Lotus Foundation, which helps to advance social welfare in diverse areas. But you don't have to make a donation to enter the contest. In addition to meeting Ringo, uh, you can have a picture taken with him. 
It includes also round trip airfare for two, hotel accommodations for two nights in Los Angeles, two very limited edition Ringo Starr Peace and Love birthday t shirts, and two Ringo Starr Peace and Love birthday bracelets, and dinner for two at a popular Los Angeles restaurant. The contest for this ends on June the 28th. And if you look in our description box, there's a link there if you want to enter the contest. Okay. Uh, Paul McCartney was in London on May 23rd to present Bruce Springsteen with the Ivor Novella Award. At the ceremony, Paul joked that there were other artists more deserving of this Lifetime Achievement Award. He said, quote, like Bruce's concerts, I'm going to keep this brief. I couldn't think of a more fitting recipient, except maybe Bob Dylan or Paul Simon or Billy Joel or Beyonce or Taylor Swift. The list goes on. Paul added, he's known as the American working man, but he admits he's never worked a day in his life. Springsteen is the first international artist to be awarded a fellowship by the Ivor's Academy, a British association for songwriters and composers. A blue plaque commemorating the life of George Harrison has just been unveiled at George's childhood home at 12 Arnold Grove in Wavertree, the first of its kind outside London. Olivia Harrison was there to reveal the tribute and call George's home a source of family pride. Commemorative blue plaques began as a London scheme in the 1860s, and they have been run by English Heritage since 1986. Initially limited to the capital, they inspired spin-off blue plaque schemes across the country, but official blue plaques are now expanding nationwide by inviting members of the public to submit nominations until July the 19th. Okay, uh, John Lennon's Lost Guitar. The 1964 12-string Framus Hootenanny guitar that he used in the movie Help which he played on You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, sold on May 30th at New York's Hard Rock Cafe for Julian's Auctions for almost $2.9 million, making it the most expensive item ever belonging to a Beatle and one of the most expensive guitars of all time. The German-made guitar was also used on the songs Help, I've Just Seen a Face, and Norwegian Wood. John gave the guitar to Gordon Waller of the duo Peter and Gordon, and after that, it ended up in the hands of a manager who stashed it in an attic for several decades. Now, this is big news that was announced a few days ago, that Mercury Studios have announced a new documentary called One to One, John and Yoko, which features performances from the historic one-to-one -one benefit concerts at New York's Madison Square Garden, the only complete concert John gave in his solo career. It will feature remixed concert audio from Sean Ono Lennon, along with newly transferred and restored footage as well as a wealth of previously unheard and unheard personal archives, such as phone calls and home movies recorded and filmed by John and Yoko themselves, directed by Kevin McDonald, known for his work as a writer, producer, and director for films such as One Day in September, Touching the Void, Life in a Day, and recently, Whitney and Marley. He says, I wanted to make a film that surprises and delights even the most dedicated Lennon and Ono fans by focusing on one transformative period in their lives and telling the tale through their own words, images, and music. Built around the beautiful 16 millimeter uh, film footage of the only full length concert John gave after leaving the Beatles, I hope the film will introduce the audience to a more intimate version of John and Yoko, while also reflecting their politically radical and experimental sides. And Sean says, Kevin's documentary brings completely fresh insight into my parents' lives during their Bank Street and early New York years, showing firsthand their unwavering dedication to promoting peace and nonviolence during a turbulent era of unrest, corruption, and unnecessary war. All right. Interesting that we have this information here, although it doesn't have a release date for this. Um, and it doesn't even say whether there'll be a separate release for the audio, whether it be um, vinyl, CD, or digital. Um, one would have to assume there has to be a DVD and hopefully Blu-ray for this as well. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, speaking of which, the first New York City home John and Yoko lived in, a two-story building in Soho at 496 Broom Street, is now on the market for the first time in over half a century, with an asking price of $5.5 million. The Lennons lived there before settling at the Dakota on New York's Upper West Side two years later. It is still owned by Yoko and Sean, is currently vacant, has a total of 3,832 square feet of loft-like space, including the cellar, along with 4,600 square feet of air rights, which could mean the potential to add up to three more floors. I've been in there. Have you really? Yeah, I interviewed Yoko there once. Uh, when um, the Rock, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum had a New York outpost down there, um, and Yoko was showing some of John's manuscripts and instruments and uh, various other things. And um, since it was down there and, I, and she was going to sort of take me on a, a little personal guided tour of the exhibition, well, great things happen when you write for the New York Times, you know. Um, we did the interview first in Broom Street. And, you know, she, it, it just, it was like a working space. She had, you know, stuff there that she was uh, dealing with. She had her staff there. Uh, she had pictures of everything that was in the exhibition and copies of all of the manuscripts that were in the exhibition. And, and so before going over to the exhibition, we, I sort of look, you know, look through a, a loose leaf notebook that had copies of all of the, uh, of the manuscripts. There was copies, but, um, yeah you know, high quality color copies, but still. Um, and then we went to the museum and it, and it was great because it, it hadn't opened yet. So it was just like us and some of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame people walking around and they're looking at stuff. And, uh, and she showed me, there was one of his pianos there. It was sort of an upright piano, uh, you know, not a grand, not like the big white one, you know. Mm. Uh, and she pointed out how... There were cigarette burns all along the top of the piano. And she said, this is because, you know, when John would be writing a song and making a demo, he'd put a cigarette up there and he'd he'd be recording and the cigarette would burn down and it would make a, a burn mark on the piano. <laughs> Great stuff. I guess they didn't have ashtrays in that. <laughs> yeah, that would have, you know, <laughs> that would have been handy. Put it in the ashtray instead of on the piano I wonder what what did they use this building for after they moved to the Dakota? Was it just storage space for the most part, or or what? Well, um, you know, she, well, around the time she was doing this exhibition, she was using it uh, not as a staging area exactly, but she was down there working on whatever she works on that that had to do with that exhibition i mean all those you know all the stuff the not the actual stuff but you know those notebooks with the copies and all that was was down there it wasn't an empty place it it seemed like it was being used and it it wasn't a place i knew about you know so when i got down there i'm thinking well yeah I, what what is this place you know i don't know what this is and then when we went out to walk to the to the museum, um, she first looked in the opposite direction down, I um, can't remember what street it was, probably Houston Street, and said, you know, right down there is where the Newtopian embassy was. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, fun. All Great. right. I went to that exhibition, the one in New York, because I've been to that one and yeah. the one in Cleveland, and it's a much smaller exhibition, the New York one with mm -hmm. a New York angle to it, but it was really good. Yeah. It was a real treat to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Those manuscripts were great. You know, that's one of my favorite things to look at, but I know that, you know, in Cleveland, they had a whole floor of just manuscripts with John's handwriting on, you know, the, mm. the lyrics of his songs and you would see him scratch out a word and put in a new word and you got to try and figure out what the other word was that he, that he got rid of. And New York city, there were a few, changes made i love stuff like that <laughs> yeah you know there was long ago um when monty python was still a going concern they put out a, a they put out a bunch of books but but they had one book that had original manuscripts of great literature and you know they've got 
Shakespeare and it says eeny meeny miny mo and it's crossed out and over it is written shall I compare thee to a summer's day <laughs> like that but you know I love seeing it in Beatles manuscripts because you you sort of see the, the the process you know as they're writing it and the things they were considering and decided to not do you know so yeah this this was a, a fun exhibition yeah all right uh a brand new one minute tv commercial for the hard rock and their new loyalty program unity uses the beatles song come together not the beatles recording uh it features uh john legend Shakira, global football sensation Lionel Messi, and multi-platinum selling songwriter Noah Cahan, who sings the Beatles song. It's the first in a campaign combining entertainment and sports stars uh, to advertise the product. Julian Lennon will have a new uh, photography exhibition of his work called Whispers, a Julian Lennon retrospective in Venice, Italy this summer taking place at the Lestans de la Fotografia from August 28th through November 24th. Just released in the UK is a new book by guitarist Earl Slick called Guitar. The book is an autobiography for the musician best known for being David Bowie's sideman, and it covers his entire career and working with John Lennon on the Double Fantasy sessions. Our good friend Jeff Slate has co-written the book with Earl Slick. James McCartney has just released another new song called Nothing, which follows the songs Beautiful and Primrose Hill. Last we heard, he was due, due out to have an EP with David Kahn as a producer. Apple Music has just come up with a list of their top 100 albums of all time. Only two Beatles albums made the list. Revolver at 21 and Abbey Road at number three. The number one album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill by Lauren Hill. Number two was Michael Jackson's Thriller. Not one single solo Beatle album in the top 100. Only two Beatles albums. Um, also, we note uh, two very important deaths. First of all, near and dear to me, the death of Richard Sherman, who along with uh, his brother Robert wrote the music of Mary Poppins, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Jungle Book, and It's a Small World After All. And But he also wrote a song that Ringo Starr covered, which became a number one song in the U.S., a cover of a song, first a hit for Johnny Burnett, that being You're 16. The two brothers are said to have written an estimated 1,000 songs for 50 movies, and they were members of the Songwriters Hall of Fame and recipients of the National Medal of Honor. A massive talent, along with his brother Robert, who passed away in 2012. Richard Sherman was 95. <laughs> okay. And also, just learning of the passing of Tony Bramwell. Tony was the press agent for the Beatles for several years. And uh, he put out a book, uh, well, I think... I don't have the exact year. It's over 10 years ago called Magical Mystery Tours. I'm pretty sure that he he ran uh, or helped to run the Savile Theater, Brian Epstein's theater, um, which had a lot of musical acts there and uh, certainly a guest at many Beatles conventions. And uh, he was 81 years old. Hmm. We do have one more news item. Ringo gave an interview apparently in San Diego and he said something along the lines that uh, Peter Jackson, they're hoping that Peter Jackson will work on another project with the Beatles, on a Beatles he said, project. He said that Peter Jackson has said yes to another project, and they're still discussing the details with, with him, and he needs to say yes again, I guess, once they go over the details. But um, I think, you know, he... he vaguely suggested to us that he was open to doing more with Apple. So, um, you know, whatever it is, I'm looking forward to it. So the guessing game continues. Mm. We should have a podcast called the guessing game. because That can go on every single. <laughs> or what is Peter Jackson up to? <laughs> That's right. Hi, Peter. It's Darren. What are you up to right yeah. now? Let yeah. us know. 
could Ken he and Alan want to know as well. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know what's going on. You know, you can pop in whenever you want. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, I'll leave the record button on even if I'm not <laughs> in the room. You could just, you know, enter the screen whenever you feel like it. Okay, so let's let's move on to our uh, idea called the Fab Five, and um, what this basically means is I'm going to ask Darren and Alan, and I will speak myself for uh, five albums for them to name: one from the Beatles together, and one each from the Beatles and their solo careers that happen to be your go-to albums at the moment. As I always say in my uh, YouTube channel, whenever I do this. I'm not necessarily asking for what you think is their best album. I'm not asking for your favorite album. Just what is it at this moment that you feel like listening to the most from each of them individually and together as a group? When I first presented this on my channel, I said, let's pretend that you're about to go away on vacation and you're packing your car and you want to just reach out to your CD collection, for those of you that still collect CDs, um, and you just you want to pick one from each, and you're in a hurry, you don't have time to think. What would what would immediately enter your brain? What would you feel like listening to the most? So, to me, that's that's an easy thing to talk about. Um, I can come up with my top five at any time. They haven't changed too much in the last few years, but we'll start. Since Darren looks so puzzled at this moment, we'll start with uh, Alan and we'll go through each of the Beatles as solo artists and then do the group. So let's start with with John. With John. OK, um, I'm going with nice, handy double fantasy, um, probably the standard album rather than the stripped down, although I enjoy the stripped down one, too. But um you know, I, I I like most of his albums, you know, probably sometime in New York, the least, and then, you know, various gradations going on. But I, I, I kind of think that in some ways, Double Fantasy was his best. Um, it has a, a relaxed feeling, but also a, uh, okay, I've been away for five years, but now I'm back and I can still do it feeling and can do it probably better than... I had in the past even, and has things like, you know, I love watching the wheels. Uh, watching the wheels is so Beatlesque, but um, it's also a, a great song about where he was at the time and for the previous five years. Uh, so that's my John pick. Are, are we going around for each Beatle or are we just going to do our, our five? Why don't we do that? I like that idea. We'll Go do around. a lot of time and then we'll end with with the group okay okay so do you enjoy the yoko stuff as much as john i do you know i do uh i don't know i've you know i'm used to yoko's voice and approach and um you know the stuff on double fantasy is much more set let's say conventionally pop than her early solo stuff Hmm. Um, which was much more experimental. And I like that. Um, but I think these things that she's doing here fit uh, the concept. I kind of like the dialogue concept. Um, I like the fact that there was enough left over for a second album of it. And they had, you know, a vague plan at least to either do a Broadway show or a tour. You hear different things uh, in which they would, sort of do this dialogue i think uh, you know it was a, it was it was a good project overall i i do like the yoko stuff um you know kiss 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 is a heads towards her experimental thing but yeah you know i, I don't think there are any bad tracks on this there's nothing i skip when i play it so um that's a recommendation I like what you said there because to me watching the wheels is one of his greatest songs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to to summarize the last five years of your life in three and a half minutes is mm -hmm. not the easiest thing to do but he said it all so concisely and uh you know his stuff can really hit you in the gut you know yeah yeah uh, 
Woman to me is one of his greatest songs. Mm. Not a Beatles song. <laughs> and and I, just like starting over, you know, is a great way to open the album. Uh, it's a great way to open an album where you're coming back after five years. Right. And it has that sort of, uh, you know, what did he call it? Elvis Orbison. Sound. Right. You know, it's, it's a little 50s, it's a little 60s, but it, it, <laughs> it, it was current too in 1980. So... Yeah, I, it's an album I really like. Okay. What I had heard, by the way, was they were going to release Milk and Honey after that and then tour. The Broadway show thing, yeah. I think, was late 70s. Mm -hmm. There was a short-lived uh, uh, play called Lennon. Right. But there was also, they were talking about the Ballad of John and Yoko. They were going to have a play, a musical, which never materialized. But as far as their plans in 1980, what they what I had heard was a tour following those two albums. Yeah, there were actually a few plays. I mean, Yoko Yoko did a play that had, um, I think, one or two, really just a few performances down in um, it was it was down in the village. I can New York remember. Rock. New York Rock. That's right, New York yeah. Rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And then besides that, I I don't know if it was the one that was just called Len, and I forgot what it was called, uh, even though I wrote a piece about it for the Times. Uh, um, but Yoko also was behind it, and it had actors of multiple ethnicities and genders playing John. Do you remember? Right. Did you go to? I saw yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I thought it was pretty good. It didn't do... It never really got too far beyond opening night, and I don't think the reviews were were that positive. I um, went to see it, and I, I remember enjoying it. I don't really remember much more mm -hmm. about that, and in a way, it was sort of it set the stage for like that uh, Bob Dylan film, I'm Not There, yeah, where they had different uh, people, different genders. <laughs> Uh, playing Dylan various parts throughout the movie, which I actually somehow have yet to see. But um, uh, I, I I remember that Lennon. I don't remember what year that was, but maybe twenty years ago or so, fifteen years ago. And you know, um, even though there there was no release to come out of that, they actually featured the song that became "Now and Then." Yes, very good call. Yep. I remember there being a song in there and um, wow, good, good memory there. Hmm. Well, I think at the time it might've been called, it had a different title. Like, I don't want to lose you. It might've, I have a hat. I'm not just any hat. I mean, I have a hat from, from that show, a Lennon hat <laughs> souvenir. Wear it, wear it on our show, especially now? if we're doing Lennon, not now, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're doing a John Lennon tribute show. Of I should, yeah. I should pull it out. Okay, so Double Fantasy is Alan's choice. Darren, how about you? What? Oh, <laughs> my pick. Mine's always the same. Lennon, it's always the same. It's Walls and Bridges. Uh, that's always been my, that's my go-to number one Lennon album. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, to me, it's sort of like, it's a, it's just a touch, touch better, I think, than mind games, just a touch. Mm -hmm. uh, and it um, kind of carries the same uh, lyrical clout that Imagine does. Um, and uh, it just is, it strikes me as being a very New York album from John. And you know what? I, I think like we talked about this a while ago here on the show. And if I apologize for this bright light that's behind my head, I keep trying to make a, a solar eclipse here and keep it blocked out on you. Um, when John well, died, um, I went down to the Dakota that Friday. And John was murdered on a, well, it was a Monday night, right? And I went down on a Friday. I was 15 and... Um, I remember going and, and giving the doorman a rose, which I thought I'd be able to put on the the gates, because if you remember, after John was murdered, the gates were covered with flowers. Mm. So um, 
while I was in front for just a matter of minutes, um, there was a, a guy who was just sitting on the ground, leaning up against the wall uh, outside the Dakota, right near, not far from the doorway, with his boom box. And he was blasting what was beef jerky, if I remember correctly. And I didn't know the song yet. I was 15. I remember, I think I went over to him and I asked him what he was listening to. And he just said, I got Walls and Bridges, the Walls and Bridges album. That stuck with me. So that's always some, it's always been a New York record for me. I will often have that playing in the car in the fall. I don't know why John's birthday, the anniversary of his death happening in the, you know, fall months. So it's, it's always Walls and Bridges for me with John. And unfortunately, you know, we have a small body of work to choose from when we're, you know, talking about things like this. Yeah. So, so I'll go with John's Walls and Bridges. Okay. Very good. Uh, for me, it's also Walls and Bridges. Even though Mind Games is my favorite Lennon album, I tend to usually gravitate between Minds and Mind Games and Walls and Bridges because they're not played as much as Plastic on Band and Imagine. Um, but I love, I think this, there are certain songs, you could say this about so much of John's music, certain songs become more powerful to you, I think, over time. I really appreciate a song like Scared right now. I love the whole vibe of that song, the eeriness of it, John's mm -hmm. vocals. It's one of my favorite vocals from John is on that song. And also Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out is extremely powerful as a song. Number Nine Dream has really emerged as being mm. a real standout in, in John's solo career. Um, I remember talking to Steve Marinucci about this years ago because Whatever Gets You Through the Night was the first single, obviously, and it was a number one hit. And Number Nine Dream was the follow-up, and it was a top ten hit, went to number nine. I don't hear Whatever Gets You Through the Night as often as I do Number Nine Dream on the radio now. I think that it's really grown in stature over the years but i love some of the the slower songs bless she was absolutely gorgeous stealing glass is very much to me at least it's like son of how do you sleep but again the whole arrangement of it and john's vocals are so amazing i love the bluesiness of going down on love and i love whatever gets you through the night i wish that john and elton john had done more work together they seem the natural pair so um i'm always in the mood for that particular album um if i'm going on a trip or something or it's always the one that i i tend to go to in recent years um sometimes mind games but usually walls and bridges okay uh, yeah and for me it's a lot of times it's both walls and bridges and mind games because to me they're sort of cut from a very similar cloth uh those two albums but i would not pick mind games now because we have the box set coming Mm. And I want to keep it a little fresh. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm staying away from any mind game stuff until uh, the 300 pound behemoth cube arrives at my front door. It's going to be lock me away for a month and just listen to all these discs. Uh, OK, so let's do let's do Paul next. Um, you want to start this time, Darren? Sure. Good. McCartney. uh this is sort of easy for me because this allows me to go right to, there's that light again. This allows me to go right to the albums that were and are the ones that are first and foremost in my heart, the soundtrack to my years growing up in the seventies. Uh, and that was most of the wings, all of the wings albums, most of them, all of them. Um, you know, I tend to like, I, I'm going to pick wings, the speed of sound. Um, that tends to be an album that if there was one that was going to be kind of brushed aside, I think, by a lot of McCartney fans, I think it Speed of Sound is the one. I know that Back to the Egg has got a, has a lot of fans, um, a lot of fans who don't agree with the logic that it's one of the weaker albums. They're very committed to Back to the Egg. And I, and I get the sense now that Red Rose Speedway is beginning... Uh, to get a new wave of appreciation, sort of what happened to Ram in the past 10, 20 years where people re 
reevaluated Ram. It's happening, I think, to Red Bro Speedway now. Um, and for my money, I, lo I loved Wings. They were banned. I loved Paul McCartney, but there was also Wings. And what I loved about Speed of Sound when it came out when I was 11 was that each member, you know, got the spotlight and got to sing and take a lead. And um, also, uh, you know, I never looked at them as being, you know, Paul's backing band. They were wings. And uh, they all sh had their moment on that album. <clears throat> so um, so that's the one I'm going to go with. Uh, and like I say, I always feel when you're talking, what is your best? What's your opinion of what is his best? feel compelled to put aside my personal tastes and pick something that is universally looked upon as being a best album for any artist. But in this case, when we're talking about what's to go to now, that's easy. This allows me to jump right in um, without any hesitation to the Wings albums. And a lot of times it's usually Wings at the Speed of Sound. So, uh, and I also I have a very, uh, this is just a personal memory sort of like what i said about walls and bridges about that moment that friday night following december 8th 1980 when i was down at the dakota and that guy was listening to walls and bridges on his boom box and it stuck with me for some reason and that album for some reason became the one for me for john uh walls and uh wings at the speed of sound was released believe it was in March 1976, which is right around the time I turned 11. And I remember, I'm an only child, and I remember the night before Easter, and I looked up when Easter 1976 fell, and I think it fell in March. Um, the night before Easter, coloring Easter eggs with my mom. I think my dad was working. And why do we remember the things that we remember? I don't know. But that Saturday evening after dinner, sitting in the kitchen, coloring Easter eggs, and I had wings at the speed of sound playing in the living room. That stuck to me. And now I have to listen to wings at the speed of sound every Saturday night before Easter. Because <laughs> it, it just takes me back to this. Just, it's like a flashbulb memory that, mm. that i have why did that stick out to me on east i don't know so that's the one that's kind of got i have a little soft spot in my heart for for that album very so nice that's my go-to one right now if you told me get in the car grab a wings uh, grab a, any mccartney album i'm taking right now speed of sound it's interesting because it gives you the opportunity to appreciate the other band members even more and i do remember and we've talked about this here on this show being radio geeks in new york city when that album came out just like with band on the run and venus and mars radio stations were playing the rock stations were playing just about every yes. track from wings at the speed of sound it wasn't just mccartney and you know i i remember very well seeing wings at madison square garden and time to hide was a big highlight of that show danny saw right it, 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 it was wplj for me in new york city right I didn't know what the hit was, to be honest with you, because more times than not, I would put on have WPLJ on. Yeah. And they were playing more than half of the album. So I don't think it I it made I don't think it, it, it clicked with me that the hit was silly love songs. I probably knew it, but it, you know, was I remember hearing She's a Baby. She's my baby. Constantly on WPLJ. Yeah. In New York and, and beware my love and others. But why, why no Junko got fair play? Hmm. You know? <laughs> and uh yeah, and actually during the, the Wings Over America tour, Medicine Jar was a big highlight too. Although that's a Venus and Mars song. But anyway, Alan, how about you? We'll find out if since he's working on part two of the McCartney. Well, actually he finished it. Maybe he's got that mid to late seventies McCartney vibe going let's see if it's one of those albums mm -hmm. which one did you pick from paul ah there you go 
as Darren almost predicted. <laughs> um, There's something about McCartney fans and Back to the Egg. There yeah, is an, an because an it doesn't intense... get the respect that it deserves. Mm. Um, in fact, the reason I have this CD is that the archival edition has not yet turned up. Paul, where's the archival edition? You know, here, here's the thing, you know, Paul actually, from things he's said, didn't like the album at the time. He and Linda both, he said they were both disappointed in it. Um, I don't know why. And he has said that he's heard it recently and he thinks it's not that bad. So maybe the archival set is on the way. Um, I don't understand why he wasn't crazy about it because, you know, I mean, it, it comes towards obviously the end of volume two. I mean, there's, um, you know, McCartney two is in there as well because he recorded it after, after doing this um, in 1979, didn't come out till 1980, but it was done in the summer of 79. Um, and in a way that was kind of a, a, a reaction to, you know, just wanting to, do something different by himself without having to worry about a band. Um, and if you think about it, he had spent from 1971 to 79 with various incarnations of Wings having, you know, all kinds of problems. If you look at it, I mean, they went on tours, they had good times a lot of the time, but, you know, first there was, you know, Denny Sywell and Henry leaving on the eve of going to Lagos to record band on the run that that was a problem for him that he overcame by just going and doing the album with Denny and Linda, you know, and making it really a great album that, uh, you know, it, it, it long last got the kind of reviews that he'd been hoping for, for all of his albums until that point. Um, then there was, you know, Jeff Britton came and went, you know, there were, there were, there were personnel issues, you know, with, um, with Jimmy, uh, particularly, uh, but also, you know, there were uh, when they were working on Venus and Mars, there were things that Jeff just didn't feel comfortable with and couldn't get under his hands, and uh, and and Paul got frustrated with that and asked uh, Tony Dorsey, who did his arrangements, was a trombone player, went on tour with him, you know, uh, if he knew any drummers, and and he brought in Joe English, um. Joe, you know, an American, homesick. Uh, his wife had a, a, a terrible car accident in Florida while they were, while he was in England. Uh, and, and, you know, he was living in England, but flying home as much as he can. That was a problem. Jimmy had problems too, um, you know, not to get into all of this, but Finally, he gets two new guys, Steve Holly and Lawrence Juber. Both of them are, you know, significantly younger than Paul and looked up to him, but they were also totally professional musicians with a lot of experience, a lot of studio experience. Uh, they weren't, unlike Jimmy and Henry, they weren't going to argue with Paul about what to play. They, you know, they did what Paul wanted done. They brought ideas of their own. If Paul liked them, he kept them. Uh, he finally had the band that he wanted in a way, you know, people who understood that he was the boss, um, but who were really good individually on their own and contributed a lot. And this album you know, he tried to make into a concept album. He he did that with several of his things. And it's not really quite a concept of it. But if you look at it, you know, it's got reset opens with reception, which is, you know, the guy tuning in the radio as he's driving along in his car. And, uh, uh, you know, finally, he's on it. He's supposed to be on his way to a rock show. Okay. 
and he gets there and, you know, we're open tonight is supposed to be about the, you know, the venue and the, whatever it was, a club, you know, where this band is going to play that he's going to see. But, but that idea sort of fell apart, you know, pretty quickly, but it's got great stuff, you know, getting closer, great track, uh, spin it on. I love spin it on. I mean, it's, you know, fast, all the things that everybody was saying, Paul doesn't do. He does in spin it on again and again and again, one of Denny's. I love that track. It's beautiful. It's, uh, it's as close to it's Denny getting as close to Paul as a composer as he ever got, you know, I mean, you could mistake it as a Paul song almost. Old Siam, sir, interesting idea, a bit odd. Arrow Through Me is great. Um, the ro- it has the Rockestra theme, which was one of his, you know, sort of pet projects of, you know, just, just roping in everybody, all of his star pals, you know, to do this big Rockestra thing. You know, it's not really that much of a track, but it has a, a good feel to it, and it's a nice little riff. Uh, what, uh, Winter Rose, Love Awake. Again, beautiful stuff. The broadcast, I mean, actually, you know, a lot of this, uh, some of these things like the broadcast, you know, it, it would sound sort of strange to us. I think if you... When when Legacy Two comes out, there's a lot of detail about how this whole album was recorded and the various places they did it and the various places in Lime Castle that they did it. You know, like in stairwells, stuff like that, um, because it was a, an old castle and the stairwells provided this you know great acoustic for particularly acoustic guitars. Uh, so you know, Lawrence talks about that. Um, oh, and Baby's Request. Baby's Request almost didn't end up on this album. It was written for the Mills Brothers. Um, and the Mills Brothers were going to record it, but somehow they had this idea that Paul should pay them to record it. And Paul is saying, well, no, no, this isn't the idea. You know, you record it, you make money from your recording of it, but you know, I'm not paying you to do it. And, and what in the Wings version that's on this album was actually the demo, you know, but it begins with this, you know, incredible little burst of jazz guitar from Lawrence, because Lawrence was, you know, he was, he was trained as a jazz player. He was trained as a classical player. He also played the lute uh and and was a rock guy i mean he was a beatles fan as a kid you know grew up listening to it and and as a studio player he played everything you know he played on on james james bond soundtracks um you know you name it so and the beginning of baby's request that little guitar figure it's just exquisite it only lasts a few seconds but it's it's unlike anything else on a McCartney album, you know, I mean, and Paul finally had someone who could do certain things that he couldn't, you know, or didn't. Who knows? Uh, you know, maybe he maybe he'll, you know, maybe he'll hear the podcast, he'll pick up his guitar and he'll say, <laughs> see, I could do it. <laughs> but but, you know, I mean, Lawrence had a different kind of um, background, a different kind of training, and he brought extra stuff to Wings that nobody had brought before. Let's put it that way. Plus, there's the video, not the whole album, but a bunch of the album. And the clips are all kind of interesting. Um, and in fact, I probably saw the Back to the Egg video before I really knew the album and and really sort of, you know, was 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 taken in by that and like the songs as well, then got into the album. And of course got into it even more when we were working on the on Legacy 2. Uh so back to the egg, because I think that back to the egg deserves what Ram has had happen to it. And uh Paul bring out the deluxe boxed set. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not only would you have the videos that were part of, it was a TV special too, you know, uh, but you also have all the film sessions of the orchestra. You know, that would be nice to see in whatever best shape you can. I've always seen more of a blurry 
copy of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said if you're going on a vacation and you're, you're packing CDs for the car, because usually for the car, I think of like an album that would rock a little bit more, something more up tempo. in which case back to the egg certainly fits the bill. So mm -hmm. I might not pick a very mellow album like chaos and creation in the backyard as much as I love that album, but I'd, I'd rather be more in the mood for for a back to the egg but anyway great choice there um my choice is flowers in the dirt flowers in the dirt's my favorite mccartney album it's it's oh. i didn't pick that because it's my favorite but it's an album that i'm always in the mood to listen to i never get tired of it i love the wide variety of music on there so many different genres of music um great melodies great hooks all throughout i liked his work with elvis costello I really wish that they had done more work together. Sometimes I wonder if it might have been a better idea if they made an entire album together instead of four songs on Paul's album and what was it, three or four on Elvis's album and spread them out that way. But, you know, a lot of the uh, the lyrics of the songs with Elvis Costello are, are much more um, complicated, wordy, maybe more intellectual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I really love that combination of the two of them. A song like That Day Is Done is very much like a gospel type song, like in a let it be kind of vein. Very, very strange song in a way about someone who's, there's a funeral and you're you're hearing what the person's thinking. It's his own funeral from the grave you know, I mean, I don't know if Paul would normally do that if he wasn't writing with someone else. Um, although he has a lot of deep songs in his catalog as well. I love We Got Married. I love the jazzy feel of that song. Put it there, the the folk element of Put It There, like, you know, kind of vintage McCartney there. Um, this one is one of his greatest pop songs. It's a perfect pop song, kind of like in, in the, the same category as Penny Lane for me. Uh, Don't Be Careless Love is a very weird song, very quirky, and it took me a while to get to love that one, and I really do really love the acapella intro, which um, he also did on Flying to My Home, <laughs> ironically, which was the flip side of My Brave Face. That's a great song. Um, Flying to my home. My Brave Face is a great song. You know, another great pop song there. All throughout this entire album, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, I know that Alan's dying for me to to make sure that I sing the praises of Oue Le Soleil. And I will here on the show because, you know, I like a very catchy, danceable song like that, even though there's only a few lines of lyrics in there, kind of like the hustle in that regard. There ain't much when it comes to lyrics. and the, There's a lot more work put into the hustle, I'll admit. But um, I love Motor of Love. A very slow song, very ballady, great melody, kind of Beach Boys-ish in a way. Um, everything about Flowers in the Dirt. Um, it, it's like the quintessential McCartney album. It was critically applauded. Um but commercially it didn't do nearly as well as it should have considering the fact that he toured with it in his first tour well world tour since 1976 and the first tour since the 79 uk tour but i love flowers in the dirt like i said i'm always in the mood to listen to it never ever tired of hearing it so that's my paul choice let's do george now alan it is your turn Okay, so I brought the niftily colored version of All Things Must Pass. Um, you know, I was going to go for, say, Gontrapo, which I, is, you know, I think a seriously underrated George album, um, probably including by George. Um, but, you know, usually when we talk about underrated albums, I bring in Gontrapo. So, um all Things Must Pass, it's his, obviously, you know, not, not counting Wonderwall. Maybe I should have chosen Wonderwall. I used to love <laughs> Wonderwall. You know, his first standard album of pop songs, his first solo standard album of pop songs. 
uh, and you know, quite a trove of them, even if you don't count the disc worth of jams, which, you know, when it was reissued a, f- a couple of years ago, I-, I listened to those jams again for the first time in a long time, and, and they actually were really pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but the songs, great stuff, you know, Wawa, I love Wawa. Uh, and, you know, we, we now also know more than we did when the album came out about what Wawa was, which was, you know, the day he quit during the Let It Be sessions, uh, he went home and wrote that. Um, But, you know, this has so many different kinds of music as well. It's sort of some country things, um, you know, Dylan's If Not For You, uh, sort of a a little souvenir of, of George's recent trip to... Uh, hang out with Dylan in New York at the end of 68. Uh, I guess it wasn't that recent. It was a couple of years. And then all the all the philosophical stuff, you know, what is life? Um, beware of darkness. And then, you know, fun things like Apple Scruffs, amusing things like the ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, let it down. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, there's 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 great stuff on here. It's an album that has meant a lot to me at various different times of my life for different reasons. Um, but I guess the other reason I chose it is that there's so much on it. It's like you know, when when whenever someone says, you know, what what would you take to a what album would you take to a desert island? Well, I, I would take the boxed set of all the Beatles albums. You know? oh like that. Uh, and this just has an awful lot to listen to on it. So, uh, you know, and it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that he ever bettered it, but he came close. I mean, cloud nine is a great album. Um, and brainwashed, even though it was sort of cobbled together after he died. Uh, I like that album too. Gontrapo. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's hard to find a bad one among George's output, but this one is just special. So, had to go with it. Yeah, when you got so many great songs in this collection, and you know, sometimes you just feel like hearing the most well-known ones, like "My Sweet Lord" and "What Is Life," and all things must pass. And isn't it a pity? But then there are times when, eh, let me go a little deeper and. Play Sir Frankie Crisp or The Art of Dying. What a tremendous song that yeah. is. Yeah. Or yeah. Lord or one of those songs. Um, yeah. It's, it's and chocolate. with Wawa, Wah, you have Isn't It a Pity? You know, so you have some some echoes of the sort of Beatle era, you know, and his his issues with his friends in there. <coughs> um so you know, just autobiographically, it's 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 got a lot going for it. Right. Okay. Darren? Uh, 33 and a third. Pound yeah. for pound, the yeah. best George Harrison album. I've said that before. I love All Things Must Pass, and I totally get how important that album is. And yeah, if somebody came up to me and said, Darren, I want to start buying John, uh, George Harrison albums, what would you recommend the first album to go with? I'd nine, ten times out of ten send the person to buy all things must pass. Um, but 33 and a third doesn't have a bad song on it. It's a, it's a, it's a very contemporary sounding album. It doesn't strike me as an album done by a former Beatles slash British musician. It's got an American feel to it, uh, which has, I think something to do with the people that he was associated with the people who were around Dark Horse Records at the time. Um, I believe Future, very briefly, he was a member of the Doobie Brothers. Willie Weeks plays bass on the album, I believe. I should have that. I don't have the the, the band uh, that played on the album in front of me. Did Billy Pre- Was Billy Preston on 33 and a third? Yes, he was. He's uh, on- I mean, it was just a killer band, and it had a, a funk feel to it in numerous places. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a, almost, almost uh, a contemporary jazz thing rearing its head at times on that album. Learning How to Love You 
uh, Pure Smoky, which was maybe a little more soul. Uh, but there was sort of a very cool jazzy vibe to it and a funkiness to it. And it was an American sounding album for me. And it also came out at the right time. It goes back to what I was saying about the, my memories of Wings at the Speed of Sound and what, you know, uh, uh, um, what uh, what was the other one I was thinking of? Um, uh, what I say earlier on? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Walls and Bridges. Yeah. For me, 33 and a third was, I think, the first, my first George Harrison album that I bought, and it was current. And I'm sure it was from really loving Crackerbox Palace and this song. I don't know if I, I don't know if both singles had been released by the time I got the album, but to me, that's a perfect George Harrison album. And I'll go to it probably more than I will All Things Must Pass. Yet, I understand all, what All Things Must Pass is, what it means. Hmm. But, so, 33 and third. Interesting what you said about it sounding like an American album. Uh, yeah, he, it was the people he was working with, the musicians he was around. I mean, it was a lot of, but I, um, I still have to finish reading Aaron, Aaron Badgley's book on Dark Horse Records. Hmm. But, Dark Horse and uh, its affiliation with Warner, first A and M, and then Warner Brothers. There was a definite American. George was in the U.S. a lot, I think. I believe so, uh, with a lot of this uh, activities with Dark Horse. So I think that that may have also just kind of put him in touch touch with, you know, a certain, you know, Tom Scott on sax and people like you know like that and the L.A. Express, right which kind of predates 33 and a third, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. So, so 33 and a third. Yeah. This is kind of ironic because Darren yeah. and I shared the same album with walls and bridges with George. It's the same thing. I also picked 33 and a third. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I like, um, at least for the car anyway, there's a lot of mellow stuff from George on all of his albums. But I love the way that album kicks off with Woman, Don't You Cry For Me, with those drums kicking right in. And it's one of my favorite album openers, you know, from any artist. And um, you mentioned Tom Scott. Tom Scott co-produced 33 and a Third with George Harrison. So that may have something to do with what you were saying, Darren, about it sounding American. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I know in the case of the LA Express, they started working with, with George on the Dark Horse album with Simply Shady and uh, Harry's on tour. So, um, yeah, I love so much about 33 and a Third when it comes to great ballads. Learning How to Love You is among my favorites from George. You can't go wrong with the singles of Cracker Box Palace and this song, which I thought was a tremendous. Yeah song and should have been a much bigger hit bigger hit i um, think everything stalled right before they hit top 10 the singles and the album as a whole i believe well and it got full 11 in, oh the singles maybe were in the 20s no the uh, cracker box palace went to 19 in the u.s and this song i think went to 25 yeah it should have been bigger hits oh yeah and yeah. uh the album itself went top 20, but not top 10. Mm. But uh, yeah, and I always kind of associate, it's very hard for me not to associate this album with George's appearance on, on Saturday Night Live with Paul Simon and mm -hmm. playing the videos for Cracker Box Palace and this song. And it was a real fun time just to see the very comical side of George with, with those two videos and sounding so good with Paul Simon. Uh, I love every song on there. Uh, True Love. Tremendous cover of the Cole Porter song. Uh, Beautiful Girl dates back to All Things Must Pass. There's a demo of that from those sessions that he had for uh, the recordings he gave to Phil Spector to review. Um, really nice song there. It's What You Value is a great song to lead off side two. Pure Smoky. You know, a lot of that light jazzy feel to me started with the Dark Horse album with Far East Man. And then, uh, you know, when you have a song like like um, Pure Smokey in there and learning how to love you, that kind of matches 
that really light jazz feel to it. Um, so overall, I'm always in the mood for 33 and a third as well. It's kind of like you can't get two albums back to back that are much better than 33 and a third and George Harrison. George Harrison's a much more laid back album as far as I'm concerned. You know, that they're really kind of equal in quality as far as I'm concerned. But as far as, you know, if I want a little bit more rock and I definitely want to hear Woman Don't You Cry For Me and everything else that's on 33 and a third, I just always seem to be in the mood for that particular one. All right, so let's uh, let's discuss Ringo. We'll start with Darren this time. Um, Crooked Boy because it's out, and you know I want to get I want to get you know familiar with it. Um, uh, so uh, although it's not an album, so uh, does it count in this? No, <laughs> Ringo. Gotta then be- I would go Ringo because it just because it's a great album uh-huh you know and i don't know maybe i, I but all right no i'm sticking with my first pick crooked boy because it's new it's it's that simple you know it's new i want to give it i want to get into the songs a little bit you know we've talked about how sometimes first listen second listen so isn't necessarily enough for something to click and um i would want to give crooked boy a fair share um so that would be my go-to now. Um, I'm still at the moment trying to figure out how much I like it. Like the EP, I still think the best one is EP three of his um, of his uh, four EPs. Five, the, five. Sorry, um, no. Re- rewind, rewind forward. Apologize. Yeah. Uh, that's the one that I think is the best of his five EPs. Um. um so yeah, I still trying to trying to like kind of take it all in. Uh so uh Crooked Boy is uh would be my my pick. Um because it's fresh and I'm sure if we did this exercise later in the year it might be the new country album. Hmm. Um But when all is said and done, Ringo's that good of an album that uh, you know, I'd want to go, oh, let me listen. Nah, get Ringo. That's you know, that's that's ground zero of all the Ringo's records. Right. Well, the great thing about the Ringo album is that it's so solid all the way throughout. It's more than just the hits, you know? I mean, Six O'Clock is one of the greatest of all of his recordings there, and Sunshine Life for Me, and um, what well, You and Me, Babe, you know? George yeah. Ron, Al Evans. So there's a lot of great stuff on there. No doubt about that. Uh, yep. Alan, time takes Good time. Pick. Good pick. In pretty much the same way, you know, starting over was was John starting over after a, a hiatus. I mean, this was kind of as well because Ringo uh, in the late eighties went into rehab. Um, he was having no luck with his albums. By that point, uh, had started an album with Chip's Moment and uh, ended up scrapping it. Um, and, you know, then 89, he went out on tour with the first all-star band and uh, then went into the studio and did this. And what I like about this album, and, you know, again, it's it's one of those albums that like everyone just sort of overlooks, but, you know, we've, we've talked a lot among us about the Mark Hudson years and the, uh, the things that Mark Hudson and company brought to Ringo's work. And, you know, and this is one of the best of them. Um, and I, the first, but he also, you know, he's got way to the world. Don't go where the road don't go, which is, you know, really sort of about the drinking and rehab experience or the pre rehab experience or his, his advice having come out of rehab, you know, don't, don't go where the road don't go runaways, you know, a song about runaway kids. I mean, what he was trying to do, I think with a lot of these songs was to, offer commentary in the way John might, you know, or George or Paul, I suppose, you know, but uh, 
he's not known for that. And I guess people just sort of shrugged and didn't really take it in. And he eventually stopped doing it. I mean, his, his albums now are really, or, or EPs are, are just sort of, you know, having fun, Ringo having fun, Ringo doing songs he likes, mm-hmm. you know, but I think he was trying to say something on this album, you know, and there were, there were some, some good songs that, uh, really are worth revisiting. And so that's why I chose this one. Okay. This is one time when I agree with Alan for his choice, because that's my choice too. Mm, Uh, Time takes time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's along with the Ringo album and the first three Mark Hudson co-produced Ringo albums. They are amongst his best. Uh, I love Time Takes Time because it's 10 songs. They're choice songs. It's a perfect album. There isn't one really bad song on there. Uh, I think of Weight of the World. Well, for you know, for people that want a beatle sounding Ringo song, mm-hmm. Weight of the World is definitely one of them. And I just think it's one of his best songs, period, in his solo career. It's a great lead off track. It should have been a big hit. He was with a record company, Private Music, that was about to fold. And they didn't have money to invest for promotion. And the album didn't really go anywhere. And it really should have done so much better. Um, You know, one solid song after another. I think he was really making a very sincere effort with this album by picking top-notch producers. He had four different producers. And you really can't tell, except for the Jeff Lynne produced tracks, who's producing the other songs, because he had Don Was on there. He had uh, Phil Ramone. He had Peter Asher. Mm -hmm. You really can't tell those songs apart. You can tell the Jeff Lynne songs, though. But really strong songs. And Runaways, like you said, trying to say something with that song. It's a rare moment when Ringo does something like that that's a heavy song lyrically. Although you can go back to a song called Silent Homecoming on Buku's of Blues. That was a very serious song about um, a man coming back from Vietnam and the parents the way he came back was not the way his parents expected him to so a very uh heavy heavy song there a message song there in silent homecoming and then i think the same thing with runaways um it's just there's so many great songs especially i don't believe you which is very beatly 1965 ringo mm-hmm. you know act naturally kind of feel what goes on kind of feel um the song in a heartbeat is one of my favorite Ringo songs in a solo career. It's got a very don't worry, baby beach boy sound to it. And uh, Brian Wilson's on there too. That's right. It's actually, this was the album where Mark Hudson made his first appearance doing background vocals on one of the songs, but he didn't co-produce with Ringo until vertical man. But um, I love all the songs on there. All in the name of love is a great song. Golden blunders, which is a posy song. Mm-hmm. Ringo covered great version of it um i'm wondering because peter asher produced that one if that was peter's idea i don't know how Ringo chose that one really fit his style very well all throughout 10 songs they're all winners to me and uh so many of them are up tempo works really well in the car so uh time takes time would be that for me mm-hmm. okay you know what i i want to I'm still going to stick with Crooked Boy, but I mentioned Ringo. If we're just if you said no, you can't pick the EPs. Got to be an album. I would go with you guys. The time takes time. It's also been a while since I've listened to that, and uh-huh. I loved that record when it came out. And I really thought it was going to do well. Um, it was on Private Music, was mm-hmm. the label, and that was a little bit of an adjustment period for this Beatle fan to see one of the Beatles on on an indie label. But Private Music was one of those labels that. I remember a WFUV in the early 90s. There were a number of, of who, what I viewed as major artists who were on private music. Leo Kotke. I believe Ricky Lee Jones was mm. on. I should look this up before I say it, but there was a few people that WFUV played that were strong artists. It was weird to see a Beatle on the label, but not knowing the industry that well, 
I guess private music was a label that may have been struggling somewhat because they weren't around much after that. Right. Uh, it's, it's a shame that more people didn't hear that album. You know, I still don't know. Don't go with the road. Go, don't go has hit written all over it and uh, way to the world. I mean, that, you know, I still am shocked when I realize that that didn't dent the charts. But that was a good pick. Time takes time, guys. Wasn't yeah. private music started by Peter Bauman, who used to be in Tangerine Dream? Yeah, there was a there was a private music was sort of I always thought of them as sort of another Wyndham Hill like label when they started. Uh, private music and then in the early 90s and, and fuv wfuv was part of this and i'm pulling a private music trying to pull a private music now um it was when the the AAA for radio format uh started to make noise um which is adult album i always get the mixed up it was album adult adult album alternative you know it was a sudden opportunity for artists uh, and a number of them were what you would consider rock artists who were starting to fall through the cracks, but still had a strong enough audience and appeal to an older audience. Uh, they were coming into this triple A. So, yeah, it, um, Yanni was on private music going back to like the earlier part of the mm -hmm. label's existence. Andy Summers did uh, kind of like new agey sort of jazzy, uh, at least one album. I mentioned Leo Kotke. And um, and yeah, Peter Bauman from Tangerine Dreams, but here, Tangerine Dream, there was only one, just one. Mm -hmm. uh, but here is the not Ricky Lee Jones, but Leo Kotke, Taj Mahal, Ed James, AJ Croce were the artists that were on um, private music. So uh, you know, um, um, well, the fabulous Thunderbirds. Jennifer Warren's. So this was a label that I thought Ringo, it was it was an adjustment to see Ringo recording for this type of label, but at the same time I thought this is a win-win marriage because Ringo is now that type of older rock artist now. But we went the label not long after that, mm -hmm. so there went time takes time. In fact, does it even say what year private music closed down? Closed down shop maybe around 2001. No, I thought it was yeah. not too long after Time Takes Time, which was 1992. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. But, oh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Here it is, defunct, 1996. Okay. So, yeah, it was not long after that. Yet it seemed to me at that point in the first half of the 90s that there were so many good veteran acts that could fall into the acoustic rock category or, or blues uh, category that were on that label but hmm. okay well that leads the beatles <laughs> so now we tackle the band what beatles album do you feel like listening to the most these days and why alan most curious about your choice I've brought the 30th anniversary limited edition. Oh, wow. um, this isn't isn't the one I'd listen to, <laughs> but if you didn't get this when it came out, I mean, it's worth looking for. It's got you know the embossed Beatles. It's right. got a serial number. Yep. It's got the open top like the British one, the British LP. It's got the black sleeves. Uh, you know, and the poster and everything is in here too, obviously. Um, what I've been listening to, however, is the surround mix. Of all the Beatles surround mixes, I've found the White Album really the best. And, um, you know, again, like with All Things Must Pass, one reason I chose it is that there's so much of it, but but also because the surround uh, version is so good and I was listening to it this weekend. Surround, it's very weird. Uh, 
until now, I've been playing surround by getting um, FLAC versions of the files, and that's just a format, if you don't know, uh, and playing it through a thumb drive through my Blu-ray player. And I ha haven't been able to get a FLAC version of the White Album that would play through my Blu-ray player. Um, I mean, I have the Blu-ray that plays. <laughs> I could just play that. But this weekend, I finally got around to doing something I'd wanted to do for a really long time, which is have the surround outputs from my computer go into my stereo system, which mm. is set up for surround. Um, I knew it could be done. I wasn't sure how to do it. Um, it meant <laughs> it meant a lot of Googling and replacing my audio driver, which somehow wasn't set up for surround. I don't know why they would make a computer set up for, set up for surround but not give you the appropriate driver. But anyway, did it and it works. And now I can play the White Album from my computer right into the surround system. And it was just great. But we all know everything there is to know about the White Album. I think at this point, I don't need to uh, go on about it. But as we, we spoke about with Walter Everett and his pals from that um, little academy that, that oh. they do, it has so many different styles of music. It's got basically every style of pop music on it. Um, and some other things like the brilliant Revolution 9, which I may be the only person on the planet who really loves, but I do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's just a great listen start to finish from the Beach Boys-esque back in the USSR all the way through to the sort of um, classic crooner good night mm. and uh, you know, so much in between birthday, dear prudence, Julia, I will. I mean, it, it, it doesn't stop and it's, it's just great and even better in surround. So there you go. Yeah. It's a marathon from the Beatles. <laughs> now we've said the same thing here on the show about it being to me anyway, the most eclectic album there has ever been you know although the beatles and certainly mccartney in his solo career have gone on to be as eclectic as possible um great choice i'd say that about any beatles album but uh <laughs> darren hey jude the 1970 compilation album which i believe was the first beatles album i ever owned hmm. And I would especially enjoy hearing it because I haven't heard it in so long. Now, I know it was part of the capital, uh, the capital box set and probably would have been in volume three of the capital albums box set, but they never did a third volume. They never completed that. The initial reissue of um, the American Beatle albums on CD. Um, they did have the volume one and volume two, and I figured, hey, Jude would be part of three, and that never happened. But when they did put out after the uh, what would that have been the 50th anniversary of their arrival in the U.S., right? So that would have been 2014, right around that time was when the Capitol, what was it? It was called the U.S. albums or the Cap so okay. that's where you go for the hey, Jude. Well, um, uh, my very large and complicated and hard to navigate music collection here at home prevents me from easily locating my box set. Although I know there are numerous ones. Um, I haven't heard Hey Jude in ages. And to me, that was the, the album that I listened to because it was my first album. It was my first true exposure beyond a couple of singles that I may have had. And, you know, even from the, 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 can't buy me love and i should have known better which were the early tracks at the beginning of the album to my five-year-old ears it was a unified 10 song album mm -hmm. i couldn't i didn't know there was a you know that they, we're talking about 64 and hey jude was 68 and i'm not even sure if i if i was aware it was a, a like a best of <clears throat> excuse me at that age but again memories i remember asking my parents to buy it for me five years old 
Uh, and, um, and then my dad probably very soon after that picked up Abbey road for me and let it be, and, uh, let it be. Uh, but Hey Jude is the first one. I keep doing this because there's a little fly around me. I don't want you to think I'm flipping out. You <laughs> pro I probably am, but, um, so Hey Jude would be my pick. It's a really, you really look at the track listing on that though. It's a hell of an album. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a non, it's a collection of non album tracks and their hits. You know, you've got, uh, what is it? Uh, let me see if I remember. Can't Buy Me Love. And I Should Have Known Better. I believe Paperback Rider and then Rain. Uh -huh. A Revolution was at the end of side one. So there's something missing there. Maybe Lady Madonna might have been on side one. Side two opened with Hey Jude. And then had, uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't Let Me Down. Old Brown Shoe was definitely on side two. And the Ballad of John and Yoko was that that might have been the end of the album. No, I got to look at it. But uh, yeah, so that's, you know, it was a, I love still, I you know, some about that photo of them on the cover. Uh, that last photo shoot, iconic photos of the band. Um, and my copy said the Beatles again on the label. So I had one of the first pressings. Uh, at the time, did not get that whole concept. I was five. Why is the why is it say the Beatles? Is... Uh oh, Oof. we lost Darren. All right. Well, hopefully Darren will will join us soon. <laughs> we don't know what the problem is, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll give you my choice for a Beatles album, and it would have to be Revolver. And I don't know what exactly it is about that album. Maybe it's because it's been so much more appreciated in the last decade or so. But um, it just blows my mind how uh, completely eclectic, I know we use that word a lot here on this show, how they branched out so much on that album going from Rubber Soul to Revolver. And the growth, the maturation of this band right before your eyes, it really does blow my mind when i listen to revolver to go from songs like eleanor rigby and to love you too into a great ballad like here there and everywhere and psychedelic stuff like i'm only sleeping and she said she said and tomorrow never knows uh more of a classical feel with for no one there's there's so much great stuff all throughout that album it's packed 35 minutes of amazing music and you're on this journey with the group and you're seeing them blossom gradually with every single album. But going from Rubber Soul into Revolver was just so much <laughs> all at once, you know, so much growth from a band. And it just um, it floors me when I think about this album now. And it could very well be because I grew up on the American Revolver first looks like darren might be joining us i grew up on the american album first where it's missing three essential songs all john lennon songs maybe once you really take the time to listen to it as a whole the way it came out in the uk all 14 songs it's so complete and so perfect that way and to end with tomorrow never knows which is kind of like forecasting what was about to unfold uh with sergeant pepper and darren is back but for that reason, uh, Revolver would have to be my choice. Um, I mean, you could pick any Beatles album. They're all wonderful in their own way. But And and the White Album it has been my favorite Beatles album for many years. But if I had to pick, you know, uh, a single album that's so compact and so interesting that shows the development and growth and them expanding so much all at one time um revolver would have to be it mm -hmm. you know i suppose if sergeant pepper wasn't given the praise that it was and wasn't played as much there is some fatigue factor i have with sergeant pepper yes i know it's a masterpiece but there's a few songs there that i've heard so much i never get tired of the songs on revolver it just sounds so fresh to me um so I would pick Revolver. I'm always in the mood to hear that album. Okay. 
Darren, did you want to finish what you were saying? I was actually at, at the end of my, my last sentence was uh, um, just m- mentioning that uh, uh, I don't remember now, but it was like the end of my thought. Yeah. I apologize. I had a little bit of a, um, a uh, let's just say the battery died. And uh, but uh, I have uh, I, I am now probably going to crap out on you guys again. So if I do disappear, let me say goodbye now, but hopefully I won't. Well, OK, well, why don't we wrap things up right now and you'll be the first one to tell. OK. All right. So before uh, my battery says goodbye, um, catch me on WFUV. I'm going to be off for a week or so. So uh, you're not going to be able to hear me for a uh, a week or so but uh, when i'm back and you can hear me again wfuv 90.7 fm new york city if you're not in the new york tri-state area um stream the station at wfuv.org uh we have an app too uh i'm on the air again like i say i'm going to be out for about a week or so uh i'll be back on saturday the 15th of june uh, on the air Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturdays from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Um, I have two Facebook pages. Uh, you could f- shoot me a friend request at my main page or just click like on the other page. We'll be connected uh, that way. And that's that's basically uh, that's it for me. OK, very good, sir. Alan. Okay, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can write to all three of us at um, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And don't forget to check our Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today Video Podcast. It has a thing that looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, that's basically it. Okay. Um, as for me, if you'd like to write to me directly, uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels. And uh, my other shows, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next show that we do is actually going to start about 25 minutes from now. Yeah. <laughs> but you'll be able to watch it permanently on youtube um we're going to be doing a show on flowers in the dirt which as we speak this week celebrates its uh 35th anniversary wow june the 5th of uh 1989 uh so that's with kid o'toole tom hunyadi and joe mayo we also did a show recently with professor ken womack where we talked about the uh recently restored let it be film um, you can listen to my syndicated Beatles show at WFDU's website at WFDU.FM. Look up archival shows, and they have two weeks worth of shows there that each run for two weeks. That's my syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing. And uh, on my own YouTube channel, which is called Ken Michaels Radio, my most recent interview is with Daryl Easley, who is the editor, get it out here, of Record Collector And this issue came out back in January, all devoted to Paul McCartney's solo career. It's a review of all of his solo albums through McCartney 3, plus special articles. Mickey Dolenz uh, makes a contribution there, as does Mike McCartney. It's a really great issue. And uh, they're actually going to put out a new one the end of the year that's all on John and Yoko. Hmm. John's solo career and Yoko's music as well. Um, So out for that i know it's half a year away but so uh yeah if you can please subscribe to all of our channels things we said today talk more talk ken michaels radio and we thank you so much for joining us this time and for alan and darren i'm ken michaels and we'll see you next time take care